as Megan said, good morning to some and um, good day to others. Um, <clears throat> some of you will be uh, uh, heading into the afternoon soon. I hope uh, so far the holiday season, Thanksgiving's been good to you. A lot of activity, particularly in the last three months, um, some exciting things coming up. Lots of changes we have to prepare for January 1st. So I'm gonna to try to cover off as much of that as we can today. And I will recommend that you stay actively engaged, um, whether it's Twitter or following the APTA or NASL or ACA or NARA, um, <clears throat> even some of the government bills, et cetera, we'll talk about this. Lots of things are going on up on the hill right now. So today I'm gonna to cover off the final rule of the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, a little bit of an update on um, some of the key items in that. One of the big things in there are, are the CPT code, CPT code changes that we know are coming and that will be effective January 1st, 2018. Um, I know maybe everybody's anxious or been tracking of the ongoing therapy cap, and the therapy cap update, what's going on on the Hill, and there's been a fair amount of progress made, but there's still no decision on a number of things that are very important and pertinent to us, so we'll cover quite a bit of information on the therapy cap. And then a little bit update on the quality programs. You've probably seen some of the information coming out from CMS where some programs there, um, they've canceled that were supposed to start next year. They're changing some of the ones that are existing. And there's some other things that will be announced uh, next year um, during the year that are gonna impact us um, possibly as soon as next year and some certainly going into the, uh, the following year, 2019. A little bit of an update on some other news from the Hill and legislative on, ongoing activities. We'll cover um, just some reminders about some other regulatory updates that will be coming early in the year, but not necessarily at January 1. Then as always, we kind of remind you of upcoming webinars we have planned and scheduled just so you can maybe block some time off on those and some events we'll be attending where you can come see us and meet us and talk to us. And then as always, I provide the resources, the links and sources to um, the material, as I said, I, all I'm doing for you, for you guys is trying to act as an advocate of pulling all the information that I've read, consolidated in various sources, and try to put it in a concise format for making it a little easier for you guys to consume. <clears throat> I always have my opinions on things, which I like to share with you folks, but I always recommend that everybody goes to the source. So go to the source, you know, read the resources, read the links directly from CMS, APTA, ONC, OIG, uh, et cetera, get, get, your, get your facts directly from the source. So from a payment update perspective, so what, what's the Medicare rate going to be? Let's talk just a little bit about that, that uh, it's gonna start Jan 1. So in 2018, the, the new conversion factor um, has gone up a little bit. So it's going to be 35,996. It's actually a little higher than what was in the proposed rule that came out in July. Um, so the good thing is, is it's in, increased approximately 0.31% from last year. I think in the proposed rule, we were thinking it was gonna be around 0.28%, so up, um, up a little bit. One of the key things to, you know, the, so they, there's, three, there's three things that come out, right? There's an update factor, which is that 0.5% sort of increase and that was something that came out with MACRA. And then they got two sort of adjustments that um, come in before they get to the final conversion factor, the target recapture amount. And that, that tends to do with the, you know, the misvalued or inappropriately valued CPT codes and RVU adjustments, et cetera. And then as part of uh, um, something else that was brought out legislatively, um, you know, we have this RVU budget neutrality adjustment, which kind of, it kicks in as well. So when you take those three amounts and adjust it, kind of do a little bit of math, you end up with the new 35996 rate, which is okay. It's it's a little bit of an increase, not too bad. You know, we'll we'll take that. That's certainly not bad or horrific news for us. So now let's get into some of the more interesting or challenging things we need to be aware of and be sort of tracking and in, in, in consideration as we head into next year, which is some of the CPT and HCPCS changes that will be effective um, within you know, less than 30 days to come Jan 1, 2018. So we know that the, these misvalued codes, um, there was 19 physical medicine rehab codes 
that were underwent sort of the code, the review process in 2016 and 2017. <clears throat> so the American Medical Association, you know, along with the you know relative value update committee and the healthcare, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know the, the healthcare committees looked at these things and they recommended both the work and the um, practice expense RVU adjustments in the proposed rule. We saw that. Um, so in the final rule, the CMS pretty much adopted what was proposed for those 19 codes. Um, the, in, in the proposed rule, they adopted what was proposed by them in the final rule. So what, did that, what that ends up meaning is, um, and there was some adjustments because you also take in the malpractice, the practice expense, and the work, the, uh, the work effort and the RVU components. Um, so some codes actually increased in values while other codes decreased in values. So let's take a look kind of quickly. When we look at those 19 codes, which, which codes were impacted either positively or negatively? And none of them significantly, but we need to be, we need to be aware of which were impacted. So on the left-hand side of the slide, of the 19, there's 12 codes that kind of decrease in value, everything from um, uh, unattended um, modalities to um, some procedure codes. So mechanical traction, uh, I put in the ESTIM code, which is the uh, uh, Medicare CMS code. That would also pertain to the 97014 code. So the vasonomatic, paraffin bath, whirlpool, ESTIM manual, iontophoresis, contract bath, therapeutic exercise, aquatic, manual therapy, self-care management. All of those codes decrease in value by some margin. If you want to see exactly how that breaks down, there's some really good links um, in the resources to either both APTA has got a really good calculator that you can hit, and there's also a nice, really nice summary table in the final rule that shows you by code what it was in 2017, what it is now in 2018, and how that adjusted uh, percentage-wise. Same thing for the codes that increased. Uh, ultrasound, neural rehab, gait training, therapeutic activities, sensory integration techniques, community work integration, and wheelchair management. Those are the ones that increased. Um, we'll talk about, um, these are just the current codes and active codes. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the other codes that were impacted um, that we really have to be prepared for just besides the small RVU adjustments that were included. So when we talk about the codes that were either new, revised, or deleted um, coming into January 1st, we need to be aware of 97532 that was deleted. That's the um, cognitive code. <coughs> There's a couple of um, um, codes, 29582 and um, 29583 that were also deleted. And they apply, to their, that's the application of um, pressure garments, et cetera. So you need to be aware of those. They made some revisions to some of the other codes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those codes because they're not as highly utilized as um, some of the other codes I'm going to talk about. And then 97762 was deleted, um, and that was the orthotic sort of prosthetic checkout code. So those codes are no longer active. You got to make sure these codes are not being used in your system. If you're using them or you're going to start billing them come January 1st with data services, you're going to get rejections and denial. So you need to make sure your systems are updated with them, et cetera. And obviously, you want to be talking to clearinghouses, make sure everybody's aware come Jan 1st, these codes um, will, would be an issue. So what's new and what's revised? So a brand new code, and we'll talk more about this one in a second, but the brand new code is 97127, which replaces the cognitive um, Cognitive Development Code of 97532. It not only replaces it, but it changes it from being a 15-minute time-based code to an untimed procedure code or service-based code. Now, that's obviously what the AMA did, and that's still in play. We'll talk, I'm going to talk in more detail again in a second about how CMS responded to that, which is a little different. Um, there are two revised codes, so 97760 and 97761 are, are the orthotic and prosthetic um, management codes. And 
not a big revision, but something that we need to be thinking about from a documentation and as we're providing those services um, in, in your care is because they've added words, the word initial um, to both of these, it obviously suggests that this code should be used once, right? Um, so not, you know, over a course of care, it's the initial because one of the new codes that they added that replaced the checkout code is 97763, which is that last code on the right. It, it now is sort of an orthotic and prosthetic management code, but for subsequent encounters. So if you have an initial management of an ortho orthesis or a prosthetic, and then subsequently you need to do some more management as the patient returns over the course of care, you would now use the 97763 um, for that. So we need to be making sure that you're we're using the right codes during the course of care and during a time of service. So I'm going to get into a little bit more detail and description, and this is something um, I alluded to in one of our previous webinars, and it kind of just uh, brushed it out a little more. So let's talk about the orthotics and prosthetics codes again. So here you see the 97760 and 97761 codes. So it's the only thing that really changed in the description and the codes themselves are that addition of the word initial orthotic encounter or initial prosthetic encounter. They still remain as a 15 minute time-based code, which is good, um, but they have that word initial. And again, what's really important is where we may have used these codes previously um, for uh, on multiple occasions over the course of a care, over the course of a single um, case or, 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 or episode of care, we now need to make sure we're only using those once. And then if we're going to have additional orthotic or prosthetic management, we now would defer to the new code 97763 which has that keyword in it, subsequent, right? So all subsequent treatment we provide after the initial orthotic or prosthetic management, we now need to use that code. So um, that's important. Obviously, it's easy to easy to do if you're consistently have really good consistency of care where you're the only person ever seeing your patient over the course of an episode of care. But if you happen to have where that's changing hands, those are things you're gonna wanna be aware of and make sure you're capturing and identifying those in billing. And I'm pretty sure if you start billing multiple initials over the episode of care, you're gonna get into some issues from a claims perspective. So then let's talk about 97172, which is the new therapeutic interventions for cognitive function. So they changed the description a little bit on this code. That's one important thing to note, um, as well as they changed it to um, be a service-based code. Not So it's no longer 15 minute units, um, it's not a time-based code. You bill it once per day per discipline. Um, and so that's an important code. What's important about this code, and I'll talk about this, is Medicare is, has deemed that this code will be considered an invalid code, and they have a replacement code, a HICS-PICS G code, that they want you to use if you're going to be providing these services and documenting and then billing for them. But for other commercial payers um, who adheres to the AMA CPT code guidelines, you're probably going to need to use this code. So you're going to need to be managing in that and tracking that. Now, for anybody on the phone who happens to use our therapy source and uh, systems, et cetera, you know, you don't really, you don't need to worry or be concerned about this because we're making all the billing code changes. Um, at the, on the 31st of December and publishing those to everybody. So all the therapists need to do as a clinical provider, you just need to continue documenting, providing the treatment as you would, and we'll make sure based on your payer or the financial service class or group, um, if it's Medicare, we're gonna pass the new G code. If it's a commercial, we'll probably pass this new 97127 code. And we'll make the necessary accounting for whether it's time-based or service-based, um, et cetera. So you don't have to change any behavior or not, you don't have to do a whole lot of education with respect to the uh, cognitive development code. The one I want to make sure you do spend some time educating and training is the whole adding of initial encounter on the orthotics prosthetics code versus subsequent encounter. When do you use that and making sure you're, you're not doing duplicative initial codes over the episode of care? That's important. 
So on the deleted, as I said before, the 97762, the checkout, um, the, the code used for checkout of orthotic or prosthetic use, that is now the deleted code. Um, so you need to make sure that that's out of your system. It will be replaced by the 97763, the subsequent code. Same thing with 97532, which is the old development of cognitive, cognitive skills um, that was a time-based code. That has been deleted as well. So with that, let's talk about what, how Medicare is handling the cognitive code change um, and why they're doing what they're doing. So CMS and Medicare have created a, a new code, <clears throat> pardon me, to replace the new 97127 CPT code. So they've established a new G code. It's G0515. And it is to be billed for cognitive function intervention services. And it's, it's considered an interim code in replacement of 97532, which has been deleted by the AMA. So they've added this to the code list. They've considered, they've also classified this as sometimes therapy. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the code changes of what always therapy versus sometimes therapy classification means. You're seeing that pop up a lot more. So we'll talk a little bit more what that actually means. In addition to the code changing, they've maintained the exact descriptor. So the, the, it's the same description of the old 97532 code. And I realize I have a semantic, it's not 352, it's 532 code. Um, the only exception is there's a slightly higher um, practice expense RVU for the new G code and a slightly, uh, slightly, ever so slightly higher malpractice RVU increase. So there's a slight increase in the G code from the old 97532 code. Um, but this is the code you're going to need to use um, if you're providing these services and you're billing Medicare. You need to check to make sure with Medicare Advantage or if there's other um, payers that may adopt this code. The reason Medicare went this way and they articulated this is because the code that, that they didn't, that AMA came up with 97127, making it a service-based code, the RVU value they gave it made it almost equal to four units of the old time-based code. So what CMS said and Medicare said is, look, you're, on average, we don't see that this, their, this cognitive function intervention code is always billed four units. A lot of times we see only two units or three units billed. So we think you're, as soon as these services are provided, you're overvaluing the code and increasing the payment of the code. So that's what that's their position in posturing. So they wanted to keep it time-based because they feel that the RVU value was way too high for the service-based code. So we'll see this. You know, it's not uncommon for us to see <clears throat> Medicare put a G code in place to manage this. So it is something to pay attention to, making sure your billing staff's aware of. Again, from a clinical provider perspective, we've made changes so you don't have to change any of your behavior, continue to document use the treatments, everything gets automatically mapped to the new codes that will be in place January 1st. But from a billing perspective, you never know if the payers are prepared for this or the clearinghouse is prepared for this. You want to make sure things aren't getting rejected because they're not recognizing it because other systems you need to pass through for claims and claims adjudication and payment um, maybe haven't been updated or recognized as code, particularly in the first part of the year. So let's talk a little bit about this language we're seeing a little bit more, always versus sometimes therapy code. So CMS has defined CPT codes most commonly utilized by providers of outpatient physical therapy and occupational therapy, as well as speech language pathologists, as always therapy or sometimes therapy. So sort of a shorter definition of what this is without getting too confusing is always therapy means that these codes must always be reported with the appropriate, you know, GP, GO, GN modifiers when it's under a PTOT or speech plan of care and that the services are provided um, by a PTOT or speech physician or non-physician practitioner. So if it's under, if it's, if it's rehab, outpatient rehab being provided under a plan of care that's been established by a PTOT or speech, always therapy code, need to have those providers. So what does sometimes therapy mean? <clears throat> so sometimes therapy code means that, uh, that an appropriate modifier of the GP, GO, GN also needs to be applied if, it's, if the care being provided and the, those, those codes 
are being provided under the plan of care that is established by a PT, OT, or speech therapist. And it's always required if it's furnished by the therapist. But if it's furnished by um, sort of <clears throat> incident, um, incident two physicians or the NPPs, and they're also, it's also integral to the PT, OT, and speech plan of care, it also needs to have those modifiers. But there are some instances in which um, sometimes therapy codes may not um, may not be provided, and so it's oops, <clears throat> sorry. I, so those instances are where it's not under the plan of care or under a PTO to your speech plan of care, and it's a sometimes therapy code. Then they are not required to obviously add the GPGOGN, and that's the same amounts associated with those codes also don't go against the PT speech cap and the OT cap. But um, if it's ever under the plan of care, whether it's provided uh, under a PTOT or speech plan of care, whether it's provided by a PTOT or speech therapist, um, by a physician or a non-physician practitioner, like a PA or a nurse practitioner, et cetera, then um, that would count also toward the cap and they, need have, they do have to provide those modifiers. It's a little confusing. There's a really good link to um, describe this in detail. It's just something to be aware of. You're also going to see in some of the um, Excel CPT codes, you'll see a designation um, indicating, you know, by a one or a zero, whether something's an always therapy or a sometimes therapy code. It's just something I want everybody to be aware of. You're going to start seeing it more. It's driving uh, more of when the modifiers need to be added and when those uh, dollar amounts need to be included as part of the caps that are associated to our outpatient rehab disciplines. <clears throat> I also included, just for now, our, a lot of the codes that are kind of categorized as either always therapy codes or sometimes therapy codes. So there's a list of um, the ones that are considered always therapy codes and the ones that are considered just sometimes therapy codes. So there's a lot more always therapy, very few um, sometimes therapy. And as you see, the last code added on on the sometimes therapy code is that new G code that's replacing 97532. There's a link at the bottom that takes you to um, some of the data right from CMS that delineates all of this for you, um, goes into a little bit more detail. Um, your billing team and whatnot can look at that, and hopefully that'll find helpful. It's just something to keep an eye on. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, therapy cap update and where where everything is at as of today. So one of the reasons, one of the things that's good and important to have an understanding of, um, it's like I, I've lost some of my values in my slide, so I'll, you'll, I'll make sure you'll get those values. So one of the things that's important to understand is why is this such an ongoing debate and why is it so critical, et cetera. I talked about this earlier in the year, and I was able to pull some uh, more recent updated data from MedPAC that came out at the end of November. So um, the reason is, is Medicare, the Medicare spend on outpatient therapy alone um, is approaching, getting close to $8 billion a year. And that's from, uh, that's on 2015 data. So we just got 2015 data come, that came out from a MedPAC, MedPAC report in um, October, November this year. So that, that number continues to increase, right? It's, it's up 7% from what the 2014 number was. And the other thing from a PT perspective is 72% of that, that spend is from PTs. And then 20% is from occupational therapy, and then 8% down to speech therapy. And all these settings use the same billing codes, and they're all subject to pretty much the same policies from this outpatient perspective. So that's why this gets such a big focus. It's a huge spend. It's also why there's such focus on some of these misvalued codes that we continue to see um, that, that are being utilized. So a little background, again, timeline um, um, for particularly a lot of our new, our new therapists. So this all started right with the, the BBA Act in 1997, so the Balanced Budget Act, when we created the, the, the initial cap, the 1500 cap for PT and speech combined and 1500 for OT. And then so through the timeline, you know, we have these things. So back in 2006, 
we that's when we started this whole KX modifier and exceptions process for going over the cap. And then in 2011 is when we first got the MPPR reduction, um, those subsequent codes, et cetera. Um, and then 2012, we got the manual Medicare review came in, and that was sort of when that when that started. That was a a mess um, from that manual review process and a lot of headache for a lot of people who had to undergo that was what, that went over that threshold that was very poorly implemented. Uh, much better now. <clears throat> and then in 20 in 2013, the, the CMS took the 50 percent. Um, uh, up from 25% on the second procedure. So again, leveraging that all related ag again to some of the cap stuff. And then Congress finally passed with MACRA that came out targeted medical review, manual medical review, which has gone much better and a lot less burdensome from what we experienced back in 2012. So from a current state of where status of where things are as it pertains to MACRA, so that targeted medical necessity review is only on certain claims that go above the 3,700 threshold for PT. And for that, again, just like the cap is a PT speech cap, the threshold is also a PT speech threshold, and then a separate threshold for OT claims. Strategic Health Solutions has, has been has been providing that as a supplemental re Medicare review contractor. Um, they're continuing to do that. It's being done on a post-payment basis. And there's some of the criteria that they're using as to when, um, as I said, it's certain claims. It's not every claim when you go over that threshold, just certain claims. They're looking at providers with a high percentage of patients receiving therapy beyond the threshold as compared to their peers. So if your peer is only having maybe 5 to 10% of their patients go above the threshold and you're sitting at 50 and 60% of your patients going over the threshold, that is definitely a criteria that would <clears throat> potentially cause some medical necessity review on some of the claims. Also therapy provided in skilled nursing facilities, private practice, outpatient therapy, and speech and language provide, you know, other rehab providers, there, because of our excessive spending and some of the, the numbers I shared earlier, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of that's a criteria, so we kind of have that spotlight on us. And the other one is of particular interest is the, the evaluation, of, you know, looking at the number of units and hours of therapy provided in a day. So is that excessive? And also is, they're looking at that from a peer perspective as well. So is it excessive compared to your peers? Um, so those are all criteria and things that are they're using to selectively do the medical re, you know, review, again, once you go over that threshold. So let's now talk about sort of where the cap is, where we're going. Where we're January 1st, what's happening now, um, get into some of that fun, fun discussion. So with the final rule, we didn't have anything in the proposed rule in July, but with the final rule, we did get a new cap amount for 2018. So it's $2,010. Again, it's $2,010 for PT and speech, and it's $2,010 for OT as well, right? Separate cap. The big thing is, is the KX modifier or the exceptions process that we have in place between now, for now until the end of the year, um, is 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 set to expire, right? And there's nothing right now. There's nothing to replace it, which means there is no mechanism of for you to be able to get payment for patients who go over that two thousand and ten dollar, right? There's no there's no modifier you can put on. Um, there's something needs to be done. So that's that's kind of a big concern. Um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately or unfortunately, with everything going on um, on the Hill and with all the activity that we had around the Affordable Care Act repeal and, and then recently with the tax bill, which has made some progress, getting attention to some of these things a little further downstream, which have a fair amount of bipartisan support, um, it's, as we sit here on December 7th, it's not looking good that uh, that something may get done or not get done between now and the end of the year. But so what what are Congress's options with respect to this, knowing that this is pending? So some of the, they have lots of options, right? The worst option is that they do nothing. It just expires and they do nothing, right? That's the worst option. Um, they could reauthorize the exceptions process um, by extending it, the, you know, which we've been familiar with with the old SGR. 
which is kind of like kicking it down the road, right? They don't have enough time to address it. It's um, they got too many other things they're trying to get passed or through, so they just kick it down for a year or two and go ahead and allow the exceptions process to persist. That's not super likely because of the cost um, associated with doing that as well. Now we had some, I would say, good news, or maybe I would uh, I would say potentially good news. So there was um, a discussion draft language that has been agreed to by this six-party talks. And what the six-party talks are, they're three separate committees that have been working on language to repeal the cap. Um, and there's representatives from both parties. So three committees, both parties. There's your six party that have been talking. And they, they came out with a draft language um, near the end of October, October 26th or 27th. I've got some details on that I'm going to share in a second. So there's hope that since that has a fair amount of bipartisan um, support and the ongoing support we're seeing bipartisan on some of the, the um, therapy cap repeal bills that are, st that are currently out there, both in the House and the Senate, that we may get something done, that we really may get something done. But uh, cost and timing and some of the other bigger bills and the other antics in Washington are definitely um, creating some noise that is impacting us. So let's talk about this draft language. What is this draft language? If those of you who haven't seen it, and I've got links to um, um, quite a bit of it in the resource. So this <clears throat> this committee discussion draft that was created, it was published on the 26th of October. They've been working for several months. So the Senate Finance Committee, House and Energy Commerce Co Committee, and House Ways and Means Committee, all these three committees which have jurisdiction over Medicare Part B, if have staff from both Republican Democrat staff working on this language to come up with this language. So they announced that they have this draft that will repeal the therapy cap and instead put in place a medical review. And the therapy cap coalition, which is a coalition that's been supporting us um, with our associations to push to get this done, are in support of this language. So let's let's take a look at it and um, I, I will say before we look at some of the things in it, um, it's kind of good news, sort of. <laughs> You'll see what I mean in a second. So here's the draft. So the, the best part of the draft is the first bullet point. It repeals the cap as of January 1st. No more cap. Um, for PT and OT, no more cap. for So that's fantastic. The second bullet item is the one that sort of confuses me and will probably confuse you, and maybe not. While it repeals the cap, they're continuing to request that the KX modifier is added in, in to all services that are, that are provided over the $2010 amount, the, which is basically the previous cap. And it's over that dollar amount for PT and speech combined, and it's over that dollar amount for OT combined. So that's the probably the most confusing part of this is that first bullet says they're repealing it, and then the second bullet sounds to me like they're not calling it a cap, they're asking for that modifier over a certain threshold, and that threshold's to be adjusted. Um, so it, to me it seems like there's, they're just calling it something else, but the cap's still there. That's my impersonation, or, or impression impression of it. The medical review process um, uh, above a dollar threshold is continued. So they're, they're actually lowering that threshold um, in this language. So in this language, they lower it from 3,700 to 3,000, and that's 3,000 for PT and speech combined, and then 3,000 for OT combined. And then they also have language that after 2028, that threshold index could potentially increase by the Medicare economic index. Um, so, you know, if, if you, to me, this would be great if that second bullet point wasn't there. Um, and there was, we, we did hear some proposals that the KX would be added possibly once it went over the $3,000 amount. But this is the draft that has been worked on by the committee, approved, and potentially it could be included in uh, one of the bills um, that may get passed between now and the end of the year. So stay tuned to this. Um, so as I said, it's sort of good news, bad news. 
everyone's saying, well, great, it repeals the cap, but at the same time, it's still including um, you requirement to add that KX modifier once you go over that um, service level um, of that dollar amount, and that dollar amount basically is what the cap is for 2018. So what is the outlook with respect to to this? What does this, you know, what, what does this mean? So more than likely that the therapy cap will be an extender policy that Congress will consider, and extender policies are things that get basically added to a bill. So this will be this will be something that will be added to a much um, bigger bill that uh, um, will probably get passed. So it probably won't be its own isolated bill. It will be an extender policy that will get added. Um, there's benefits to that because one of the things that's important is um, there will need to be offsets. One of the big questions with anything, just like the current tax bill and, and um, tax cuts and jobs bill, is how, how does all this get paid for, right? So there's a pretty, the estimates on the cost of this is, is you know, seems high, but it seems reasonable what they're saying, but they're gonna need to put in a bill where there can be offsets to figure out how they will pay for the policies of repealing the cap and putting this in place. But stay, again, really stay tuned on that. The best thing we can do is we know we have the current Medical Access and Rehab Services Act the Senate Bill 253 and the House Bill 807. <clears throat> the Senate Bill has um, has continued to grow in the number of people, um, the number of uh, supporters on the bill, and the House Bill has also grown um, in the number of people supporting it quite a bit as well. So I think the uh, the last I checked, the House Bill now has 226 co-sponsors. So we really like to see that number get into the high twos or into the threes um, from a House perspective. And the Senate bill um, has 36. And that's up from like the middle of this year. So there's been a number on the House bill, there's been a dozen or more recently within the last 30 days become added co-sponsors. And a lot of that's through a lot of activity from grassroots and some of the things our associations and you guys are doing, which is great. And the same thing at the Senate, there's been at least maybe half a dozen people of senators who've um, thrown their sponsorship behind these bills. So continue to hammer your Congress then from a grassroots perspective on these bills because it is going to make a difference if we're going to try to get something done and get it done um, sooner rather than later with all the activity and noise that's currently going on in Washington. So from a quality update, um, not a lot of detail here, but I didn't want to cover off a couple of things that have come up recently and some things we need to be prepared for as we head into uh, 2018. So we probably all saw um, some of the announcements that came out from CMS um, recently on some of the bundled payment models and value-based um, care models. So they've they announced a couple of things. So they announced um, they're making changes to the um, comprehensive care joint model, the CJR model. So they're pulling back a little bit. So they're making it, um, they're reducing the number of mandatory areas from 67 to 34, so a pretty big cutback. They're also being a lot more flexible um, in some of the rural um, and lower volume hospital areas in the model. So making it, making their participation in those geographic areas uh, to be definitively voluntary. Um, so again, trying to, using this to get data to drive value, but trying not to be um, as onerous. And when I was in Washington last week at a big um, ONC conference and Seema Verman was speaking, you know, there, the one thing she is very aware of and continues to talk is, talk about is how, how do we, that um, she doesn't want policies and regulations to be so burdensome that it's impacting the quality and of delivery of care and the quality of care it's being delivered. And they're taking really, really hard looks at, well, they need data to be able to drive value and provide um, evidence-based care and value-based care at the same time, not at the expense where it's impacting the quality of the care and it's such a detriment to the providers to be able to collect it and provide it. So that, that was encouraging, at least I thought that they're very aware of that and it's not forcing down some of these policies regardless of the burden it puts on us as a provider and the impact it can have on the beneficiary themselves. 
The other thing we saw was they canceled um, some of the episode payment models in the cardiac rehab incentive model. So they canceled the mandatory hip fracture model and um, the cardiac bundled payment models. So they've canceled those, they're re-looking at those. Um, the only thing I would say is just to you know, temper your excitement about, great, all this value-based care and these payment models are going away, they're starting to cancel them all. Well, value-based care is not going away. There, there's still going to be that ongoing movement to more of an episodic um, sort of payment model, um, look paying for value and quality um, versus just fee for service. So a um, couple of hiccups, making sure they're getting the process and implementation right and not putting a burden on the provider and the beneficiary or mitigating the burden, so which is key. Um, so a good they acknowledge that, pull that back and realize that uh, um, there's probably better ways to do that and continue to look at them as they continue these in their innovation centers, so stay on uh, on top of those. Some other things we want to be aware of as we head into 2018, um, because I say they're quality issues, but they can have impacts on us, and so ABTA talked about this as well, and um, so the whole, all of the post-acute care settings are moving closer and closer to a single standardized data set from an outcomes perspective. Right, and so from a quality uh, care delivery perspective, and so that's going to be interesting um, to watch and see, and what the impact is on that, particularly for us an outpatient who aren't, you know, part of that those pack settings. So how is that going to impact our PTs, OTs, and speech therapists? And what is that going to mean? Is it going to drive more data? Is it going to have more burdens? Um, because there obviously was definitively reasons for uniqueness of some of the data sets being captured in home health and in skilled nursing um, and in LTAX, et cetera. Um, and so as they move toward the data set, it's going to be really interesting to see how that impacts uh, the ability to deliver our rehab therapy. The other big thing, and looking moving to the right, is sometime probably in the middle of the summer, could be May, June, July-ish, maybe more June, July-ish, we're going to find out for sure, and I put in here PTs, but we're going to find out for sure whether PTs, OTs, or speech therapists will be included in MIPS, uh, in the MIPS program starting in 2019. So um, watch out for that. Um, lots of information kind of going one way or the other. Um, I'm hearing, I'm actually hearing myself with dialogues with people in DC and some of the regulatory folks and talking to <clears throat> some of the um, APTA folks who are plugged into the regulatory, that it seems to be that we're leaning more and more, CMS is less and less interested in cl including us in MIPS and would rather see us more involved in the al our alternative payment models. But again, stay tuned. I'm going to be tracking this pretty actively. We're preparing from a technology perspective um, to make sure that, you know, everything, we're running certified EMRs and we're prepared if that's the case in MIPS and it still may be required to be a certified EMR even on an alternative payment model, et cetera. But um, those are things to be watching for. I wouldn't stop if you're recording quality measures, the old PKRS measures, continue to do that. It's a good thing to be able to do. Um, be able to see um, it's no impact on us as therapists um, for reporting that and providing that data. But again, stay tuned because that will be interesting to see what impact it was. Um, the alternative payment models we're, are evolving and will continue to evolve um, with or without our participation from a, you know, a PTOT and speech perspective. So, you know, <clears throat> Eventually, we're probably going to need to be participating very actively in those. So watching what they're doing, how they're doing, how they're evolving is very important. It's something I'm going to be keeping an eye on as we do regulatory updates and how that's going to impact us um, as things seem to flow downhill to us. And then the last thing which is known is technology is unavoidable. So the ability to provide capture, provide, and exchange, and share data. The conference I was just at last week in Washington was the ONC conference, but it was the ONC IT conference specifically on interoperability and data exchange 
both from a uh, from a public and private sector, and it's dramatically improving um, and in increasing, particularly in the large hospital space and the IDN space, with um, with the public sector, um, and not quite as much as we get downstream into the physician space and particularly in our outpatient therapy um, or in post acute care space. But the ability to exchange data and capture and have that data available and use technology to do it and do it seamlessly is going to be critical. So um, those are things to be thinking about and considering and we're planning um, uh, to be able to support that with a number of things we're doing to be able to be exchanged data in and out of our systems for all our clients. So <clears throat> that's just something to be thinking about. Let's talk about some other um, news from the Hill. Um, maybe some good news, really good news. Um, so one of the exciting things that we saw, which was very disruptive for a number of us, was when the, the TRICARE, the, the ability for the fact that the PTAs and CODAs were not um, included in TRICARE, so for under TRICARE for all the military and defense contracts and payers, et cetera, um, that was a real um, a real hit um, to a number of people across the country. So the new National Defense Authorization Act now includes thanking uh, a lot to work done by the APTA and some of the other associations. They actually included almost to the letter the language that was proposed by the APTA to add PTAs and CODAs into the TRICARE program. The best news is that's great, but both the Senate and the House have already passed the bill, and it's actually sitting um, on the president's desk waiting to be signed. The anticipation is that will be signed sometime in and around the 15th of December, so there's high anticipation that that bill will actually be signed into law between now and the end of the year. And that's a really good thing. If you want to see some of the specifics of that language, um, that uh, um, for adding the PTs and, and CODAs to be able to be included in that care, there's a link to the actual bill there. And then just if you, three, I think it's yeah, it's page 379. I've got it up on the slide. If you go there and you want to read that, there's also some other links on the Tricare update in the resource guide <clears throat> that I want to make sure you're all aware of. Um, some additional regulatory, I had this on last couple of slides, and I just want to keep this a forethought um, for everybody um, from a general perspective, but just keep in mind that um, the, the new Medicare number, new Medicare cards um, are coming, and so, you know, everyone, those are going to start being issued and shipped to patients, and so in April 2018, which seems like um, a long way away, but um, it won't be. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, I, it's nothing you would do. I wouldn't worry about it between now and the end of the year, but as you get into the first quarter next year, those are things you want to make sure that your systems are prepared to handle that. Um, if there's any issues with being able to manage that, that type of alphanumeric number and the sequencing of that number, um, you know, where it needs to go on segments, if you need to talk to your payers, uh, if you do direct, direct bills, you need to talk to your clearinghouse to make sure they're preparing and supporting that, um, particularly if you have a large, a large Medicare population. Um, and just your own education with your staff, both your front office staff and your back office staff, because beneficiaries may be confused about this, like their number's changing, what's their number, why is their number changing, what does this number mean, where do they use it, where do they reference it, um, et cetera. So again, <clears throat> we'll continue. There's a provider page, web page on there, provides you a fair amount of a link to that, provides you a fair amount of information that with respect to this Medicare number change and the card change. The other thing um, is there's a good fact sheet there. Um, and just, again, it's something that I think it's a really good opportunity as providers to be sharing with beneficiaries and helping them, um, you know, understand what this means and, and the more confidence you guys have in, in understanding what it means that you're prepared for it and stuff, you'll ease the stress and burden on the beneficiaries and the patients you're seeing um, who have that. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna, I think we're, I think I actually um, covered most of what I wanted to cover. So Megan, I'm gonna toss it back to you to cover some of the updated 
um, webinars and events, and then any questions that we've gotten, we've got some time to cover some questions. Sure. Well, as 2018 looks to probably be another exciting year on the regulatory front, we definitely want to invite you to um, attend our regulatory sessions again next year. Um, the first one we'll have in Q1, we're going to have it a little bit later in the quarter, just since the turn of the year. Um, there's a lot of things that are still up in the air, and we want to have things a little more definite before we present another session for you. So we'll send the link to register for that session. It'll be March 15th. Um, again, at the same time, 11 a.m. Central. So some additional events that Kasamba will be at. I'm going to flip the slide, David. Um, we will be at APTA CSM in February, um, stop by our booth um, there in New Orleans if you're attending. And then we'll also be at the NARA conference in May in Washington, D.C. And those are the, the more outpatient-focused conferences we'll be at, um, though CSM is everyone. And there will be a couple other ones if you also overlap into some of the other segments that we service, such as skilled nursing facilities, long-term care, home health and hospice. Um, so check out our website. Um, uh, early in 2018 and we'll have those events updated. So David, there are a couple of questions if you're ready to answer those. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the first one that has come in concerns plans of care. So will therapists need to establish new plans of care for January 1 with the new code? No, there's no there's no need to. If you're, if you're currently treating a patient um, that uh, um, you're actively seeing, say, on December 31st or December 30th, and you go into the new year, you, there is no need, unless there is a change in, in, the, in treatment or in the plan of care, there is no reason to create a new plan of care come January 1st. Thanks, David. So another one that has come in concerning the codes, do you think there will be any issues with PTAs or OTA is billing for 97760 and 97761. Yeah, so I think probably one of the reasons someone may be asking that is because of the word initial, and we always sometimes think of the word initial as like initial eval. Is this an eval? Um, it's still it's still a management code. From my opinion, it's just a matter of. Um, making sure you've got good processes in place and some things we're looking at to put maybe rules in place that um, there's no reason why a PTA or a CODA having authorization to treat and provide that could they could not document or use those codes. Just because the word initial is in there, all the, all the, all the AMA and CMS is trying to do with those codes, particularly AMA, is just going to use this code when it's the initial encounter for an orthotic or prosthetic management and then if you're subsequently going to manage that orthotic or prosthesis for that patient during that episode of care, use the subsequent code. So um, there's, no, there's no need for like the PT to have to use the initial one and then the subsequent can only be relegated to the PTA or same thing for the OT and the, and, and the CODA. Okay, thank Good you, question. David. Um, we, ha we have received a few questions um, concerning outpatient in our smart application. And I followed up with a few of you. <laughs> and I'll also send these on to your account manager to have them follow up directly. Um, but if you do have a question, if you think of something a little bit later today, maybe that we didn't answer, definitely feel free to contact David or myself and of course your account managers at Kasamba and we'll be happy to answer. Go ahead and flip to the next slide. Was David. that it, Megan, for questions? It is. Awesome. So um, on the resource, um, tried to all these are active links, um, and when you get the slides, even if the, even if, if they're in PDF format, all these are active links to be able to go straight to the sources. So um, yeah, so please go and review some of these. Everything on the final rule itself, um, and then some of the. The billing of therapy services that covers the sometimes and always and the RVU changes, et cetera. Therapy cap, really good links to the bill, and you can see status of the bills. You can see how many co sponsors there are, and in um, <clears throat> also any activity from a CMS therapy services perspective on the cap. 
the new Medicare number, I included that just if you want, there's some really good stuff if you want to create handouts or materials for any of your beneficiaries or patients. The quality programs just really updates on the, the changes that were recently made to the CJR and some of the other um, uh, cardiac models and, and the uh, hip fracture models. The fact sheet that just came out with respect to that at the end of November. And then they've, their interim and uh, the interim and final rule with respect to the changes they made on the quality programs. And then from APTA, again, some more material on the physician fee schedule. That's really good. That calculator is really good to be able to see from a practice perspective in your setting and your location or locations what are the what are those increases and decreases I'm going to see on an individual CPT code basis. Um, and then APTA has done a really, really good job of staying on top of the therapy cap issues, what the cap agreement is, payment under the cap. Um, I also really recommend looking at the NASL site, which I did not include as a good site. They've got, they're, they're really staying on top of um, um, changes in the cap and what's happening with the exceptions process. <clears throat> and I will be tweeting rigorously um, on any changes that go on between now and the end of the year, particularly around the cap. Um, and activity we'll see with respect to that or any movement on the cap bills we see. So if you want to uh, make sure to follow me um, with respect to that. And then I've got a link on the um, on the TRICARE bill that passed the Senate and House, and I'll be tweeting about that when that gets signed by the President. And then just for information's sake, if you want to see that MedPAC report that just came out at the end of November on the 2015 data, how it's broken down to source of some of the material I had earlier, You'll, you'll, um, that's a, a good resource for you. And then Megan, I'll let you wrap us up. Sure, we ended almost perfectly on time today. So just a couple of words to close out. Um, definitely, if you'd like to learn more about our company or our products, you can visit us on our website at kasamba.net, or you're welcome to contact us um, via phone. It's 818-991-9111. So be careful when you're dialing that. Um, and of course, we'd love for you to connect with us on our social media platforms. We're on all of the usual suspects, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and also on Instagram. And of course, you can follow David for any um, up-to-the-minute updates with the regulatory changes. He is at the underscore McMullen with an A on Twitter. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we always appreciate you spending your lunch break with us and look forward to seeing you again in 2018. So have a wonderful holiday season. And again, thank you for joining us. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays.